the lesson from the Old Testament this morning is found in Psalm 3. It's on page 380 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles. Or if you're like me and you prefer a different version, maybe you have a cell phone application. Otherwise, don't use your cell phone in church, I'm told. <laughs> Listen for the word of God. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. Selah, which has never been translated. You can choose to think of that as a, a worshipful word, like amen. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy hill, Selah. I lie down and sleep. I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Rise up, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. Selah. The lesson from the New Testament for this morning is found in Matthew 26, 57 to 75. It's page 24 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, have you no answer? What is it that you testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah, who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you're talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse and he swore an oath, I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, teach us through this horrible and at times grotesque scene 
from the scene that reminds us what's within the worst of us, but also how easily we are to be scared off from you. Strengthen us through this passage. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, you work all week, and you try to get a good introduction, and then you get a children's sermon, and you just want to go, all right, that's it, folks. I'll see you next week. <laughs> that was good. Now you have to endure me. So how many of you are familiar with the 90s comic strip Calvin and Hobbes, those great philosophical thinkers? Yes. Not John Calvin and, and Hobbes, the philosopher. Um, it, Calvin and Hobbes played this, it's about a, a five-year-old boy and his pet tiger, his, his stuffed tiger, and they have a game that they play that they call Calvin Ball. And as you see by the cartoon that's in the, the, uh, the handout today, Calvin Ball has only one permanent rule, and that's that you can make up the rules as you go along and you don't play the same way twice. So the, the rules can change according to your needs, according to what's going on, and so it leads to some pretty funny uh, moments such as this where Calvin is reminded of his own rule and he said, you're going to pay for this one. Uh, he, I believe, was just hit with a with a uh, volleyball from afar. It's a fun game, however, in real life, things can kind of turn badly if, uh, if we play like we play by Calvin Ball. Although it could be argued that parenting is Calvin Ball in real life. You just make it up as you go along. The kids don't know any differently, and so you say, no, this is the rule. I think, I've got to remember that rule now. <laughs> That's kind of the fun side of where Calvin Ball might apply to real life, but then there are some other darker times when Calvin Ball applies. Sometimes we can get into job situations where it feels like the rules are shifting beneath us. Our boss might be changing the way that, we, that he or she operates. The rules are changing. We don't know what to expect anymore. And it's not because they're following the regular rules, but it's they're making up the rules to suit their needs and their wants and their desires. And not just in jobs, but this can happen in relationships too. The rules can shift and change. They start, people start playing Calvin Ball with relationships and start changing the rules of the relationship to suit their own needs and wants and desires. Calvin Ball in everyday life can turn kind of dark. And this is where we find Jesus in today's story. We find the religious leaders playing a bit of Calvin Ball with the rules, changing it as they go along, suiting, making the rules suit whatever they're needing at the moment, and the rules are shifting. Although unlike us and unlike Calvin, who can get caught off guard and say you'll pay for this, Jesus holds steady in the midst of all the changes. And that's where we come to today's story. Last week we left off with the, the, the arrest of Jesus. The mob that Judas came with came and they brought their swords and they brought their clubs as if they were going to get an insurrectionist. And Peter and the disciples offer a weak defense chop off the high priest's servant's ear, to which Jesus says, don't. You don't get it. But then he turns to the crowd and he says, you guys don't get it either. I've been out in the open every day and here you come at me like I'm an insurrectionist, like I'm an insurgent. And Jesus rebukes both his own disciples and this crowd, and after that, the disciples jet. It's getting a little too hot in the kitchen. And they need to find someplace safer. So we come to this week's text, and Jesus is led to Caiaphas' house. Now Caiaphas is the high priest. He is the one who is in charge of all the temple. 
And they bring him to Caiaphas' house, and there assembled is what they say are the elders and the scribes. What this is is something called the Sanhedrin. It's a group of 71, and they function as the highest court in Jewish culture at this time under Roman rule. The Sanhedrin had the ability not just to take care of religious matters, they also controlled internal affairs and laws and culture and so on and so forth. <coughs> These are the elders, they're the high priests. They had the ability to pass judgment, they had the, some ability to pass a death sentence, though not without the Roman approval at the time. And Jesus is brought to this assembly in the middle of the night. And like all courts, there have to be assistants. There have to be clerks. There have to be people helping out. Uh, and so the Sanhedrin assembled would have brought helpers and servants and assistants and, and guards. I was an administrative assistant at my seminary for nearly three and a half years. I was one of those people that kind of came with the main entourage, although I was never in the room. My job was to make sure that the main entourage knew what it was doing and to make sure that, that everything was taken care of behind the scenes. In some ways, it's a little bit like Downton Abbey, isn't it? You've got the, the main power brokers, and then you have the people who actually run the show. And this is why Peter is able to slip into the courtyard and come relatively unnoticed, because here you have 75 priests and elders and scribes, each bringing their assistants and their helpers and their aides, and they're bringing the temple guard. And so there's a flurry of people who don't all necessarily know each other. Like a Christmas party where you don't know people. It's easy to kind of slip in. Or a wedding. People who slip into weddings and say, yes, I'm your second cousin twice. Don't you remember me? How's the cake, by the way? And so Peter is able to slip into this situation. Because not everyone knows each other. And he's able to go and he's able to listen. And G, uh, Peter here isn't coming in order to break Jesus free. We get that right in the text. He comes in order to see the outcome. The end of how this is going. Because it seems like Peter is finally starting to get it. For all the times that Peter has stood up and said, Yes, Lord, I'll do this. And Jesus is saying, no, you, uh, you're going to deny me. You don't get it. But Lord, the perfume, it was so expensive. <laughs> Do you not get it? And right now, it seems like a moment of dawning is hitting Peter because he's following to see the end. After all the predictions that Jesus had made along the way saying, I'm going to be killed. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure you are, sure you are. I'm going to be killed. No, Lord, never, not you. And finally it hits him. He might be killed. After all the warnings, Peter seems to start to wonder, could Jesus have been right? How is this going to end? And so quietly he slips in to the courtyard outside of the high priest's house. He's looking and he's saying, I wonder what's going on. And Matthew gives us this little tidbit to let us know that Peter is there and we might need to be looking at both Peter and Jesus. But real quick, Matthew slips back to what's happening inside of the high priest's house. And the Sanhedrin is looking to charge Jesus with a capital offense. They are looking for a capital crime, something that they might pass the death penalty. Now, it seems that what was happening was somewhat of an investigation. This isn't seem to be a formal trial, because if this were a formal trial, there were a lot of irregularities of what was going on. The, the Sanhedrin was meeting at night, but it needed to meet in the day for a capital offense. 
And they needed to have witnesses and a chance for the accused to come back and give his side of the story. None of this is going on. And so if this were an actual trial, it would be highly irregular. But the Sanhedrin was setting aside rules and laws in order to get what they wanted, not the truth. But they also were assembled to maintain the appearance of being decent and in order. Because what the Sanhedrin needed in a capital case in order to convict Jesus and pass the death sentence was actually a pretty high bar. They needed to get two witnesses to testify in agreement, separate from one another, about a capital offense. And they needed to do this without coaching the witnesses. Again, they're trying to keep this impression that things are decent and in order. And so they're having to bring witnesses in and say, what's going on here? And what, what charge do you bring against him? And find another witness. What do you say? And they're going through witnesses. And you can see the high priest just sitting there going, no, 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 not what I'm looking for. Not what I'm looking for. And they go on and on. Now normally, if there's a capital offense something worthy of death, and they need witnesses, the penalty for perjury in a capital case was capital punishment. If you gave false testimony in a capital case against someone, they could come back and execute you. And so they're letting all this false testimony just kind of keep rolling and rolling and it's not false because people are making it up. They might be coming in and saying some things that Jesus said and the high priest is saying, well, that's not really worth death. He might have said this, okay. It's false because Matthew recognizes no testimony against Jesus warrants the death penalty. No testimony against Jesus is going to convict him of anything. False testimony is there because Jesus is innocent and anything else was just false. And so what this becomes is a giant fishing expedition. Let's see what sticks. And they're casting it out and reeling it in and seeing what, gets, what catches. And finally, two witnesses come in and they misquote Jesus, which is great. They misquote him. They come in and say something that he vaguely said in John. And they say that this guy, this fellow, and it's meant kind of as a derogatory term, this, this guy right here, he said he could knock down the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, if you're threatening to knock down the temple, obviously you've got something against God. And the high priest takes on this and he, he thinks this is close enough. This is close enough to a capital offense. And so he goes and he pursues the matter further. He himself asks Jesus on behalf of the Sanhedrin, on behalf of the prosecution there, did you actually say that? What is this that these people are bringing against you? Because he's recognizing it's not enough at this moment for these witnesses. I need Jesus to, to say it himself. And yet, Jesus sits there and remains silent. Jesus sits there in almost an authoritative way, refuses to respond. These are accusations, these are questions that don't even merit a response from him. We're not even, I'm not even going to deal with this. And Jesus seems to be in control of the situation. And so Caiaphas comes back and asks him a question that merits a response. He asks him a theological question. He asks him a question about God and about him. Are you the Christ? The Son of God. Here's a question I'll bite on. 
And our versions have different have different ways of what Jesus said, of saying what Jesus said here. Literally, he said two words. He said, you say. Are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? You say. It's almost as if Jesus is saying to the high priest, that's not the way I would put it, but that's the way you're going to understand it. Because the idea of Messiah for the high priests and what Jesus came to do were radically different. And so Jesus needs to say, yes, that's what you would call me, but you don't get it. And his statement is ironic because he's asking, you know, are you the one that's going to, uh, the high priest is sitting there saying, I'm judging you. Are you saying you are the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus is saying, yes, but do you understand that I'm going to be the one sitting in judgment of you, not you of me? Because you believe you speak for God, whereas I am God. Well, at this point, Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin have their evidence. Everyone's heard the response. It's garbled enough to interpret it however you might like. And so Caiaphas rips his, his garments. This is an act of, of mourning, of, of, of blasphemy, has been spoken in front of the high priest. And he says, what's your verdict? And they all say he deserves death. But this isn't the only trial that's going on in these moments. Peter was experiencing his own trial of sorts. We need to pick back up with him because Matthew does. Because while Peter is sitting in amongst the aides, a servant girl comes and, and approaches him. That's very interesting because Matthew, it doesn't come out, Matthew makes special note that it is one. It is one servant girl that approaches Peter. And we get the sense that it's an approach, it's not a public approach, it's walking up and saying, you, you were also with them. Jesus of Galilee. And it's kind of a private, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, I, I, do I recognize you going up to someone in the middle of the grocery sh store that you're sure you've seen in church on Sunday and you're thinking, do I say something? And she comes up and you, you're one of them, aren't you? You're with Jesus of Galilee. And Peter gets publicly defensive on this private statement. Peter hears this question, he thinks, oh no. No, I am not one of them. Small, small statement. And Peter's saying, no, no, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Are you kidding me? I'm not, no. Look at me, I am not following that guy. I don't even know him. And someone else a little bit later says, hey, you've got to be one of them. You're with Jesus of Nazareth. That, that little Galilean town up north. Is, is, why, the, he's the reason we're here, aren't we? And Peter once again, no. Goodness gracious people. I don't know him. What don't you get about that? And a little bit later, the, the kicker comes in. Some people say, of course, you, your accent gives you away. This is like someone from Boston coming and saying, it's March 22nd. And you say, yeah, you say, what? You're from Boston, aren't you? No. Nah. It's March 22nd. I had a trombone professor in college. I started out as a music major. I had a trombone professor in college who we were in the middle of a lesson one day and we put down our horns and we're talking and he said to me, looked at me and said, where are you from? And I said, Pittsburgh. He looked at me and said, you don't sound like you're from Pittsburgh. Because we all have our distinct accents. The accent gives it away. Katie is smiling because she knows that I can turn on the Pittsburgh accent and people from the area would understand if I'm going downtown, get some chip chop ham and that. 
And people who have been to the area would say, he's from Pittsburgh. It's easily recognizable, and, and Peter is getting called out, and he's getting more and more defensive. He gets more and more over the top. He gets an oath. He, he takes the most solemn oath he can and says, I don't know the man. Peter gets questioned by a servant girl and he goes and he denies Jesus. Jesus gets questioned by the high priest and the Sanhedrin, people who can put him to death. And he stands and he says, yeah, that's that's who you would say I am. But you just don't get it. Peter isn't able to stand up to this scrutiny. It's like Matthew wants us to catch the irony here. One servant girl kicks off this over-the-top response. And immediately the rooster crows and Peter realizes what he's done. The memory comes flooding back. Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And in an instant, it comes true. And Peter goes and he feels remorse and he leaves. He can't even stay to see the end. He knows what he's done and he weeps bitterly. And perhaps even Jesus' words in Matthew 10, verse 33, come back to him where he said, whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Peter knows he's committed a grave, grave error. He's in great danger. Not danger from the people around him, but danger in his own soul. Whereas Jesus is in danger from the people around him, but is safe and secure in his soul. Now, while most of us can see the danger of denying Jesus from this passage, what else can we learn from this trial of Jesus, but also this trial of Peter? I think the first thing that we can see is that there's a little bit of Peter in each of us. It seems ironic at this point that Jesus nicknamed Peter the Rock. At this moment, this is the same person that Jesus has said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because this is not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven, and on this rock I will build my church. Right now, the rock seems a little bit more like sand, doesn't he? Shifting with whatever is there. Aren't you with him? No, no. Wasn't me. Of all the people to build a church on, that doesn't, at this moment, he doesn't seem like the right person He's a little less than a rock. But yet, after the resurrection and after Peter's reinstatement, he has a change. He is the spokesman for the twelve. He is the chief of the apostles for a while. So what's the difference? What changes in Peter? Well, it seems that at this point, Peter seems to be relying on his own strength. Remember the the verses, I will never leave you, Lord. I'm going to get up and I'm going to strike down anyone who comes and I'm, ar, ar, ar. I got this. All on me. And he follows from a distance and the sad reality is he can't even follow Jesus from a distance well. The going gets tough and he flakes out on Jesus. I don't know him. (laughs) Yet after the resurrection and after Jesus reinstates Peter, if you read through the beginning of Acts, it seems like Peter gets it. He starts to rely not on his own strength, but on the strength that comes from his relationship with Jesus, and he relies on the Holy Spirit and on prayer. You see in Peter's speeches in the beginning of Acts that he begins to point squarely to Jesus. The difference is instead of I am going to do this, Jesus, I will never leave you. 
Peter starts saying, find your strength in Jesus. The first person pronoun doesn't show up as much. It's not I, I, I. It's him, him, him. It's he is able. And so if we're relying on our own strength, Matthew warns us about what will happen. Our hope and our strength should come from a robust relationship with Jesus and on the strength that comes from him, on the strength that comes from the Holy Spirit. Peter was the rock not because of his own strength, but because he relied squarely on Jesus. That is, like the old hymn, when his hope was found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So who are we relying on? Do we rely on ourselves and about what we will do for God? Or do we rely on the strength that God has given us and say, it's what you would do and what you want me to do? Yeah, what can we learn from the trial of Jesus? We have two trials here. And it's interesting when you look at the trial of Jesus, because despite the total disregard for truth and wanting the reality to come out, Caiaphas actually says some very, very real things about Jesus, doesn't he? Tell me, are you the Christ, the Son of God? Is it true? Well, yes, Caiaphas, actually it is. But again, not as you understand it. I haven't come to overthrow armies. I haven't come to overthrow the Romans. I'm here to do something far, far greater. There's some very, very deep truth in the trial of Jesus. It's just that everyone seems to miss it. And the reality is, when, while Caiaphas attempts to control the outcome of Jesus' life, Jesus backhandedly says, it's me who's going to control the outcome of your life. <laughs> and for everyone else's life. And for us, this can work in two different ways. We can think of ourselves, well, I'm a good person, I do good things, I volunteer down at Christian care. I help tutor kids. I, I do this. I, I'm doing pretty well. Mike Wendlin racking up points, mowing the lawn. But on the other hand, there are some of us that, that don't have such a wonderful opinion, and I'm not saying Mike does. So let me clarify that. He's just an easy target. There are some of us, though, that take life hard and we say, I would never be good enough. Lord, I am never, never good enough. We have this tendency to one of two directions. We start judging ourselves and saying, how can I measure up? Or, look at how I measure up. But the reality is, we're not the judge. That's a good thing, amen? Amen. We're not the judge, the final arbiter of, of the outcome of our lives. Who are we trusting to be our judge? Ourselves? Those around us? Or the creator? The redeemer? The one who is justice all in and of himself and who has paid the price. The one who knows our sufferings and our pain and said, I'm going to take those up because I can't leave you alone. The one whose love couldn't leave us in our own sin. As one song puts it so well, the beauty of grace is that it makes life not fair. The beauty of grace is that it makes life not fair. 
Who are we trusting to be the judge of our lives? And whose strength are we relying on in our walk with Jesus? Let's ground our strength and our hope on Jesus. Faithful and true drudge, the rock on whom we can stand. Amen. Lord, we give you this word to seal in our hearts. Help us to rely on you. Help us to not shift like sand. Help us to know your will. Give us strength as we go forth, Lord. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.